the soft fat. That's just what I was waiting for. Uh, welcome. This is our norming session for almost spring. And thank you all for being here. We've got uh, 102 folks, uh, 103 now, and 200 plus registered. So thank you for that. And we look forward to seeing most of you. Um, uh, here's our agenda for today. We'll have some announcements. Uh, we're going to have a few poker statistics. And we have a couple of spotlights. Uh, Long Beach City College is here in College of the Redwoods to tell us uh, how they've been developing and managing their local poker program. We'll have norming topics uh, between Cheryl and Sean on those particular uh, sections, criteria of the rubric, and some reminders and wrap up. And save the date for uh, our next norming session on June 7th. 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, put that in your calendars now and we'll be uh, to you before then with um, invitation and Zoom registration link. So we're very glad you're here. Um, I wanted to start by talking about uh, uh, the invitations we send out for the norming sessions. You know, we have a, we send these just to our local poker leads. Uh, otherwise it, there would just be a, a list of a thousand people. And then we ask the local poker leads at each college to forward the invitation and the registration link to their uh, team members. Uh, however, still with uh, 200 or so folks on our local poker lead list, some colleges have two, um, these sometimes don't get through. Sometimes they get blocked by your email server. Sometimes they get automatically placed in your spam folder. So what I'd like to ask, if you don't mind, is if you did not get the email, uh, please check your spam folder. And if you see it in there, uh, mark the sender as safe sender, or perhaps your email system uh, allows you to say not spam. And in theory, that should take care of that problem in the future. If, we, if you have other issues, if you don't even see it in your spam folder, please email me at bnash at cbc.edu and uh, we can uh, handle that in some other way. If you just got here, uh, please note this session is being recorded and uh, you can find the, the recordings on our website, the Poker Resource Center website homepage. Uh, scroll down to the bottom and you'll see the recordings there. So we have some announcements. I know uh, some of you are aware of some of the status issues with At One for the 23-24 academic year. And we have our executive director, Marina Amini, here to tell us more about that, if there is any more that, that has not been said yet. Marina? Yeah, I don't have a lot of new details. So hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, I am looking forward to working with all of you and hearing a little bit about Long Beach. But I wanted to just share that I'm at the Sisawa conference, which, which is, let me get this right. I know Hussam is also here because I saw you yesterday. Um, it's the Chief Information Systems Officers Association. Um, and so I will only be able to hang in for the first 30 minutes or so. Uh, I know that a topic of concern and interest has been about the future of that one. And um, if you are a DE coordinator, you may have heard us talk about it or as part of our consortium or advisory. Um, I just want you to kind of you know, hear it from me. We're very actively engaged with the chancellor's office. The chancellor's office wants to ensure that there's continuity for poker, that, um, that you all have the support that you need. I you know, launched poker at my own college. I know how hard it is, how much work and time and effort and honestly how much money goes into it. And there's a lot of investment from our system. So um, I have spo spoken to uh, Vice Chancellor Rebecca Rana Shaughnessy, and she's very much aware of this investment. She's interested in helping us continuing, continuing it and come on, coming up with a plan around it. Um, what the mechanics of that looks like, what the staffing around that looks like, what the organization around that looks like, I don't know yet. That's, that's to be determined. We're sort of sorting that out. But I very much have, you know, sort of an assurance that poker will continue, that there's interest in continuing it and that there's value in it. So um, I, I hope to have a little bit more by our June poker norming session. Um, I think by that time we'll have contracts and kind of negotiations wrapped up. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that the next time you see me, I'll have a little bit more of some like firm information to share with you. I don't know if folks have specific questions for me around that or if I can even answer it, but um, you're, you're yeah. welcome to put something in chat or, or raise your hand. I don't I don't see anything in chat yet, Marina, but um, uh, Michael Q showed up to our um, CCMS meeting last Friday and talked about a no cost extension. 
of possibility for a no-cost extension of at one courses in the summer. Is, yes. What's the status of that, if any? Yeah, so what that means is kind of fancy talk for saying, you know, we haven't wrapped up contract negotiations. However, there could be a way to authorize us to use some carryover funds from our other grant to support summer programming and summer support. So but no cost means like, you know, they don't have to give us any new money, but if we have some existing money from our CBC grant, we're trying to work out a plan where we could potentially tap into some of that for summer programming until we wrap up um, kind of the negotiations and, and the plan for the rest of that one. So that's what the no cost extension is that we're talking about. And it would really cover, again, summer programming until we sort out some of those details. Okay, thank you very much. I'm monitoring chat, don't see any questions. I'll give a few seconds if any of you have any questions for Marina. Thank you, Lisa. At one is critical to continuing growth for our faculty. And I'm gonna put my um, email address in chat. If you ever have any concerns, if there's you know anything causing you anxiety, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm happy to meet with you one-on-one, -on -one, go over your concerns and kind of you know dig into it a little bit more. I know this, it's kind of a big group today. And so if you come up with something later, there's my email address in chat. Don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you, Marina. Appreciate you being here. And I, I know- you I see a question. Early. Yeah, sorry. I think I just saw a question from Sylvia in chat as well. Um, will all the resources offered by at one be maintained? Yes, the, the plan is not to like wipe out the website or remove any resources. So absolutely, we're going to keep everything intact. All of the adoptable courses are still there. Everything on Canvas Commons is not going away. Those are and will continue to be available to colleges. And uh, Sylvia, you specifically mentioned the self-paced accessibility courses. I don't know if you noticed, but there's been some change there. Some of those were removed because the CCC Accessibility Center has taken over some of that training through, um, Cheryl, what is their, their program? They, they're offering some courses there through- WebAIM. WebAIM, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you go to their website uh, to get those, but we, we still have some on our website and we'll keep keep those. All right, thank you, Marina, for that. Appreciate it. And and now I have some news about a staffing change. You may have heard already that uh, Helen Graves, former ID for CBC at one, has moved to Foothill College to play a similar role there and uh, work with Lene Whitley Putz's team, um, uh, which is doing great work there at Foothill College. I want to congratulate Helen. And uh, Helen, are I think you're here. Uh, what what what's your first week been like? Oh, Bob, don't put me on the spot. Okay, okay. It's been lovely. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, it's a great team over there. Uh, uh, Lene's doing some really good work, and um, and that's setting the stage for what others can do. And by the way, she's always willing to share ideas and best practices. So um, I think we might have her uh, in one of our uh, highlights here, maybe this summer in June. All right, moving on. Uh, here's some latest poker stats. We now have 44 fully certified colleges. Uh, just a reminder for those who don't know, that means that um, you can align your own courses and you tell us name of the course, name of the faculty member, and then we just go into our exchange and badge that course. Uh, that's after you've been through all the training and the capstone exercises uh, to earn that status. So 44 out of the 116, uh, it's over a third, but uh, certainly we have some some work ahead of us. Um, and right now, at well as of yesterday, 1,274 courses have been aligned and badged in our exchange through poker or local poker or, or the old uh, design academy. All right, now I'll uh, hand it off to Cheryl to introduce our spotlight. Thank you, Bob. So today we have the pleasure of hearing from Long Beach City College. Michael and Hussam are going to tintillate us with their exciting program at the college and what they've been doing over the last maybe what year or so. So I'm just gonna let them take it away. Who's Thanks leading? Cheryl, I'm gonna yeah. share my screen. Cool. Here we are. 
All right, Hussam, go ahead. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate you inviting us here. As always, it's a pleasure to be working with all of you and collaborating with everyone and sharing the, the, the great things that our team at Long Beach is doing and also hearing what others, other institutions are doing. Uh, my name is Hussam Kashu. I'm the Associate Dean of Online Learning, Educational Technology and Learning Resources. Michael. Morning, everybody. Pleasure to be with you. I'm Michael. I teach anthropology, and I'm also serving as the online education faculty coordinator here at Long Beach City College and as the poker lead. Thank you. Um, so for today's presentation, we're going to talk about a few um, items. Um, starting poker, um, meeting with you, you introduce you our team, local um, poker team, um, our recruitment processes, our poker processes, and our future goals. Um, majority of this presentation will be led by Michael as our poker lead, but a few words I just want to give um, in case it, it supports anyone who's still developing or trying to think about how to where to start. Um, prior to becoming a consortium college in December 2020, um, we used to always plant seeds for an awareness of these initiatives and concepts within our institution. So we would present to the OE, um, the, about the OEI rubric and local poker to academic senate, to our dean's team, our vice president of academic affairs, various faculty, online education committee, and others. So anywhere that we can present it, we would present it so we can build that awareness. Um, we integrated the four sections of the OEI rubric within our low, um, online teaching certification program that's locally that we, we train. So the concepts were there. And we collaborated our faculty leadership, um, the Senate and the union, to update our faculty contract evaluations for online teaching, um, the forms to include some of these concepts as well within the, the rubric. Um, so that was part of it to plant those seeds and awareness of these initiatives so people are, it, it doesn't come at one time. Um, we also built a lot of external and internal partnerships. Um, external partnerships are with the CBC OEI and our at one team. Uh, we began collaborating with, with, with all of you here um, to understand what recommendations you had, suggestions, what other institutions were doing, so we can kind of get a better feel of what we should do or where to start. Um, and then internally build those partnerships with our Academic Senate president and the executive team our faculty union, our curriculum chair, uh, course evaluation subcommittee chairs. So a lot of our faculty leadership um, who are strong voices in supporting our local poker processes and helping us develop those processes in the team, which Michael will be sharing and showing what we've achieved. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Michael and he'll, he'll show you the great things that they've been doing in the leading. Thank you. Thank you, Hussam. Yes, you said it, all hands on deck for poker. And uh, so let me share with you all what we've been up to at Long Beach City College. And don't you worry, I'm going to share this slide presentation with you once I'm done speaking. I'll drop it in the chat for you. So let's jump in with a little bit of context for starting poker. Now, we've been at this for years, even before I started as DE coordinator in 2020. But I wanted to begin with this image, which I know most of us, if not all of us, are familiar with. This comes from CVC OEI on what the poker process should probably look like. And I want to emphasize what how it says, spend 90% of your time here with faculty preparation, because frankly, I couldn't agree more. So we've really taken that to heart at Long Beach City College and built a very robust preparation program for faculty so that they are well scaffolded before even thinking about poker for their classes. To give you some examples, here at Long Beach, we have two required trainings for all online instructors. They are Intro to Canvas and then our Teach Online Seminar, which is an online teaching pedagogy training, and it draws through uh, from elements throughout the CVC OEI course design rubric. In addition to those required trainings, faculty are strongly urged to participate in other optional trainings as well, such as our 10-day accessibility challenge, which we uh, gratefully borrowed the concept from our friends up at Foothill College, a YouTube video series, which is wonderful. We've adopted PDF, PowerPoint, and Microsoft Word accessibility tutorials from the comments and we've localized them so that they apply to our faculty. Also, we've held a lot of workshops for this and we've recorded them and put them on YouTube so that faculty can refer back to them anytime. Each workshop typically focuses on one section of the rubric or in some cases it's the section A, which is quite large, splitting that up in half. 
And then even smaller uh, opportunities for faculty to learn the language of the rubric. Every Tuesday, I send out a newsletter with a YouTube video that is two minutes or less, roughly. And each week's newsletter focuses on one element of the rubric, see, see A9, A4, B2, and just very quick tidbits that faculty can implement into the classes right away. Again, these are all in an effort to just build that awareness. Oh yeah, I know what section A is all about. I know what section B is all about before they start the poker process. So once that preparation is taking place and ongoing, I have to pause and, and really put the spotlight on our poker team at Long Beach City College. As you can see, we're faculty from all over the campus, uh, different, uh, different departments. We have full and part-time faculty. I also wanna to highlight too, that our uh, chair of curriculum is on the poker team and participates in the reviews with us. So is the uh, course evaluation subcommittee chair. So it's very nice to have uh, different aspects or different players and shared governance be a part of poker as well. So really, I couldn't ask for a better team. Uh, they, they work together, they collaborate, and they let me know when things could be going better so I can help figure it out. Recruitment. Okay, so we started building our poker team in spring of 2020. And if you remember, spring of 2020 was kind of a rough semester. In fact, I, I believe I was starting um, my poker certification course in, in the last week of March, perhaps. So it was it was a very challenging time. But there were a few of us that got through it that first semester. But then things were so busy with COVID, we didn't do a whole lot with our certification until 2021. And that's when we worked with Cheryl. Thank you, Cheryl, for all your support. We started working with each other's courses. We, Because at this time, we knew the skills of doing poker, but we had never actually done it before. So we practiced on each other's. And then now we're focusing on recruiting faculty submitters once we became a local poker campus. And we started very small with individual outreach. Uh, part of my role as online coordinator is that I facilitate the trainings for new incoming online faculty. And sometimes when I would see someone in the training that seems to really have a knack for it and seems to be really interested to dedicate the time, I'll say, hey, why don't you check out poker? So it was that individual one-on-one -on -one sort of outreach at the beginning, and which honestly was a little bit slow. So beginning in 2022, I started reaching out through department heads. So I'd reach out to all the department heads on our campus, and I'd say, hey, if you know faculty in your areas that are stellar and dedicated online instructors, please send them to me so I can tell them about poker. And so we got a little bit more buy-in through that method. Now, spring 2023, we're even increasing our outreach by visiting department meetings ourselves. And I'll give a 10 to 15 minute pitch for how poker uh, you know, can, can help you. And we've gotten even more uh, interest by making those presentations at department meetings themselves. And faculty can ask questions um, and, and we're right there to answer them live. So that's been very, very useful this semester. And then of course, funding, right? That's, that's a part of it. We do compensate our team members. Okay, it's a lot of work as you all know. And fortunately we have been able to draw from CARES Act and now more recently HERF money in order to support those stipends for faculty reviewers and also for faculty submitters. When they have fully aligned their class with the rubric and we submit it uh, for badging, then they earn that $500 stipend. So let's talk about our local process. This slide, and again, I'm gonna share the slides with you once I'm done speaking. This slide, each of these images is a link 
that will take you to these resources, which you are welcome to adopt and localize however you would like. But the first one is our newly designed website. And I will exit the slide just for a moment and take you there. In fact, honestly, I, I drew uh, some inspiration from the Poker Resource Center. I had never done a Google site before, and but I really like how you all did it. I thought, hey, let's do our own local poker site at Long Beach. And so that's what we did. It, it, if you haven't done something like this, it's actually not terribly challenging. I am not the most tech savvy person, but we want to feature faculty who have gone through the process. We want to spotlight them. We also want to provide enough information that a faculty member can decide for themselves, is this right for me, just by visiting our website. So we talk about the rubric. We identify, what, what is this all about? What are we looking for here? We have videos that sums up what the poker process is like and how does poker work? What do we actually do? And what are the benefits for you? You know, what does that entail? Stipend, quality review badge, increased success rates, and so on. And how to start. Are they eligible? Are they fully trained to teach online? That's, that's a big must for them. And so on and so forth. And then additional resources are localized uh, tutorials and workshop recordings. And then also some wonderful resources such as course design resources and some videos from you all as well. The next resource right in the middle here, and by clicking on this in my slides, it will actually take you to the Canvas Commons. But what I'm gonna show you is through Long Beach City College Canvas. And that is, let me make it a touch larger. There we go. Yes, this is our poker Canvas shell. So when a faculty member says, hey, Michael, I want to try poker. I say, great, let's get you started. First thing is we enroll them into this Canvas shell where they begin the process. And there's very simple navigation. They also get a you know review of who's on our team and also want to shout out that our online learning program manager and our dean, Hussam, who's here with us today, are both poker certified. They did the training as well. And that's really helpful because they understand even better what it is that the team is doing. So it's great to have um, managers and a dean part of this process as well. But so the faculty here, they'll start with our orientation module, which lets them know, it's kind of reviews, what's this all about? Is my course ready for poker? What's the timeline expectations and benefits? We even have a it's a play posit video, so they have to watch it and answer questions about what is the CVC OEI course design rubric? What does that entail? And then they begin phase one for poker. Phase one is they take a short survey. And that short survey um, is it asks them, you know, what class do they want to submit? Are they full time or part time? What how is their uh, accessibility score just to get a baseline? of where that is. We all we have Ally, but we also use Pope Tech here at Long Beach uh, City College to determine that. And they schedule an initial meeting with me. And during that meeting, we, we sit down or over Zoom and they give me a little tour of their online course. You might be thinking, and you'd correct in thinking this, that each step is a little tiny check-in point to assess their readiness for poker. Because what is often the case is I'll meet with somebody and I'll say, hey, I love that you do your own videos. Do they happen to have closed captions? And it, when the answer is no, and they have several dozen videos to get closed captioned, that's when I usually pump the brakes on poker for now. And I say, look, let's get your videos captioned. Here's a few other things to work on. Let's talk next semester about poker once those tasks are done because I don't want to assign a course to my team when there's something big like that, a big hurdle that would stop the entire process once everybody has already started the review. So as it continues, folks will submit a course prep form and then they will create a master shell and submit the URL. At that point, 
After step five, my team will jump in and they will begin the poker review. And phase three is that collaboration, feedback, and redesigns as necessary. And finally, our third item on this slide is the course design tracker that we're now using at Long Beach City College. And you perhaps have seen this one before. It's a wonderful resource. We adopted and localized it. And I like to say we made it a performance enhancing course design tracker because we've added a few elements that my team finds very helpful. First and foremost, this overarching, how are these categories doing? Can be filled in so that at a glance at the first page, I can track Hey, who, how are these sections going? And then this is what my team uses as they complete their reviews. Uh, typically, we'll have two reviewers. Each one gets a column. I always put the reminder for the we language in their comments. And as they go through section A1, they can mark whether it's started or not started, incomplete, aligned, exemplary. And if anyone needs a refresher, they just click on the link here. And where does it take them? Ah, A1, placement of objectives. And some tips on what to look for. We love this resource. So we linked it within every single element of the rubric. As my teammates conduct the review, they will go through and each one will fill out these individual columns. Before we return it to the faculty member, I will often check in and then I will merge the columns so that it is one unified uh, comment from the poker team. I'll also remove the names for, so that it is anonymous. And then usually we will have a meeting with a faculty member and we'll discuss any items that are incomplete. Here's where you need to take actions and here's where you need to note the actions. And once those actions are taken, then usually I will check in and confer with the poker teammates who made the initial review to make sure that it's all good to go. Once, as you know, once every section is aligned or exemplary, then we send a nice congratulatory email to the submitter and we submit their course for badging. And then we move on to the next thing. So, Clearly, I could talk about this for hours, but <laughs> I'm moving rather fast. Let me let me conclude. Art with our future goals. I strive, and Hussam does as well, to ensure that even if a faculty member isn't ready for poker yet, that they are working towards that gradual and continuous improvement. That's why we have so many trainings. That's why we do the online teaching Tuesdays and the videos in the newsletter, so that the entire college starts learning the mentality of why this is important. We also want to find some long-term and reliable funding for poker. Um, HERF is just about done. So we're currently looking into alternative funding sources to keep this going. Uh, we are also in progress with phase two of the CVC course exchange so that we will become a, uh, a teaching college as well, which is exciting news. We want to collaborate with our Office of Institutional Effectiveness here in order to carefully track student success data when they take a poker-aligned course so that we can further uh, really bolster our efforts with it being data-informed. And then obviously we want to create something that is a balance of ambition and sustainability, right? So we, that is an ongoing effort. How many courses can we align and how many courses, how high can we get without uh, burning ourselves out in this effort? Because you all know how much work this can be. With that being said, I don't know if we have time for questions or maybe we should do that later, uh, but thank you for your time. And thank you, CVC OAI folks, for hosting us today. I am going to drop the link to the slideshow in the chat right now. Thank you, Michael. Amazing. And you make everyone happy. You make me happy anyway. 
because I love to see how over the years, all the materials that were produced are being used and integrated into your own programs because you have to make it your own. All right, well, thank you. We'll take questions right after Christine. So Christine is our next showcase presenter. I'm looking for her on my <laughs> blocks here. There you are. Um, and she's from Red, the Co College of the Redwoods. So now you can take it away, Christine. Okay, and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And yeah, my name is Christine Dobrowalski and I am the poker coordinator for the College of the Redwoods. I'm just an associate faculty member and I am essentially the poker lead. But I, what I'm gonna talk about is where we are in the process because we are not quite as far along as Long Beach. And by the way, Michael Hassan, that was a fantastic presentation. I have so many good ideas. I can't wait to incorporate them. Uh, we are just getting in the process of getting certified and we really just started last spring. So what I wanna talk about is how we got to where we are and what our process will be moving forward. So, I am in our internal poker course. It links from a course, a faculty development website that was essentially created during COVID that everybody in the whole, whether you teach online or not is enrolled in. And so they can easily link to the site or faculty can go directly to the site, but it is internal. It's not a public site. It has all of our resources in here. So what we did was we started, so last spring, our, faculty DE chair, uh, she essentially went to our distance education committee and started pushing poker. She went to the Senate and SEC committee. She met with the administrative meeting. She just started pushing. And although poker and the CBC OAI has been in conversation for a number of years, she was one of the big forces really behind really moving this forward. In the DE committee, we had a lot of conversations. We created a subcommittee and that's where we really started hammering out the details. We used the CBC OEI resources extensively, answered all the questions, looked at the stakeholders, how can we develop this process, who will be involved in the process, what funding will be needed. And that's where our VPI came in. She's the one who found um, had the funding and got the stipends, and we used her funding to create our positions. Our team is... Me as a poker coordinator, we also have the faculty chair of the Academic uh, Senate DE Committee. The director of distance education, we did not have before last summer. So she was hired just last summer. And this has been just a huge help for us because she has uh, professional development Fridays. We talk about uh, poker in those professional developments. We send out newsletters, we have a poker highlight. So she has, um, and she's super supportive. So this has been, I think, essential for a part of our process. We have an instructional technologist, the instructional designer who also was recently hired and we're all just thrilled about because we all need help with accessibility. And the college also just hired a digital accessibility assistant uh, to help with things like captioning and um, remediating PDFs. So again, this was a, a huge help. And of course, our most important are our peer reviewers and faculty guides. So again, we're pretty new in this process. We have five peer reviewers right now, peer we'll say peer and lead reviewers, and a couple of those are serving as faculty guys, which are mentors. Now I'm just going to kind of jump to this page here. Our, we have a whole page for peer reviewers. Um, how do you become a reviewer? The process, here's our SARTCO, which is our stipend. This is uh, $40 an hour per four, as I do a review, up to 10 hours. I'm pushing for next year for it to be the CBC OEI model. So that's the 300 for the peer reviewers and then 500 for lead reviewers because we're designing where lead reviewers are gonna be more involved. We'll see how that shakes out, but um, that's what I like to see. Faculty guides, so these are mentors. They're mentoring our uh, course authors. That's someone who will bring it through the poker process. And the same rate is about $40 an hour. I think this is going to go up or we're hoping to see it go up. No more than 30 hours per course. What we've found is I 
it's going to depend on the course, obviously, as we know, but we're finding that our faculty guys are probably going to be spending this much time, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Faculty guides and reviewers have to be poker trained. They should be experienced online uh, faculty. They should have developed a course within Canvas. The course authors are paid just based on the badging. So once they get a badge, they'll receive $500. However, we consider the training that they're, we consider their course building, the effort they're putting into the creation of their course. We're considering that uh, professional development or flex time. So they can use that time for their professional development units and then also get the money for badging. I'm pushing for more money. We'll see what happens. It's a lot of work. I think everybody knows it's a lot of work for these course authors. So we are currently in the certification process. Last year was kind of thinking about it, outlining it, funding positions. This fall was uh, pushing out those positions, recruiting, recruiting course authors. And this was done with professional development, the newsletters, uh, just messages to all faculty going to meetings, um, pushing that message out training faculty, getting them signed up to take the poker uh, training. We had a couple of experienced reviewers, but the rest of our reviewers are pretty new, recently trained. And we have four who are going through the training this spring, which I'm thrilled about because accessibility is in the training. So that means we're going to have people besides me doing the accessibility reviews. So thrilled about that. And then we actually started pairing our faculty guides with our course authors last fall in preparation for the certification process. And as you can see, we're, we're on track. We're, we've just completed our second course review and our debrief with us, with uh, Helen uh, yesterday. Helen, we're sorry to see you go, but Cheryl, we're thrilled to be working with you. Um, and then we'll be starting our third review. Okay, so this, Info, this infographic is it's new. It hasn't been pushed out widely, but I think it's it helps like show our process. And I think, you know, this is going to look familiar to all of you. I did reviews for the CVC OEI and I really modeled almost everything after that process because that's what I was familiar with. Our goal really is to before the review to help prepare the faculty for the review. And as I was you know, listening to Michael talk, I'm thinking, wow, well, there's so much more that we could do. Like you've really done a fantastic job. And as we've gone through this process, I can see where we really want to build in even more training. But our goal right now is to match a faculty guide with a course author and then giving them about 10 weeks to go through this process of trying to align their course or at least prepare their course for the review. And give them access to the instructional designer. And that's really why I wanted to limit it is we didn't want you know, the faculty guide to say, hey, I've got free time this semester. And then a year and a half later, the, the, you know, the author's like, okay, I'm ready to work. And now we don't have a faculty guide. But as I reflect on this, I'm realizing 10 weeks is not enough. It's, it's really not enough to prepare them. Uh, and also faculty are busy. So a course author might be, you know, have more time one month, but the faculty guide is busy, and then the faculty guide might be busy. So I think coordinating that a little better as we move forward with our local poker process, and I think we need to build in more training. And I, I like the idea of having a training course. We haven't gotten that far, but putting our faculty through a training course. What we're hearing in our professional development series that we're giving about poker and going through the rubric is that faculty, a lot of them are really intimidated about getting reviewed. So we really want to create something that's, you know, less of a review and push it out there as, hey, do you want to improve your course? Do you want to make it better for student success? And, you know, most faculty are, yes, I do. Well, how, this is how you can do it. You can go through this process. And so that's, that's really our goal. We do have, um, let's see, I think on our course author page, we do have this step-by-step -step guideline. You'll notice it's pretty similar to the CVC OEI process. 
we have, you know, a timeline. However, I realize it needs the poker coordinator really needs to be meeting with the course author and the faculty guide initially and really kind of hammering out how they should go about this process of alignment. I think once we become more experienced, especially the guides, uh, we'll get better. Uh, but this is um, this is helpful for the for the course authors, but I think it, we definitely need to have a little bit more hands-on involvement as we move forward. Instead of the course prep form, we've actually had faculty go through the rubric and just write out a self-assessment. And another thing I, I've realized is that I, I wanted them to go through and do this and identify areas where they may not be aligned and then work with the guide to help bring those into alignment before the review process. But if the faculty don't have a clear understanding of the rubric, then they're not going to rate themselves correctly. Uh, so I, what we need is to have the faculty guide really work with them on the rubric and have the training on the rubric before they even do this. We do have them have a final, they do submit their final self-assessment after they've worked with the faculty guide. And we have our local poker process. So we're still in our certification. The first couple courses are just a team review, which, which has been a fantastic learning experience. And now we're really going to be testing our local poker process with same thing as the CPC OEI model. So a lead, a peer, and an accessibility reviewer. And what we're going to be doing is having the lead and peer reviewer meeting with the accessibility reviewer. And initially the, the poker coordinator will be there as well. I happen to be both of those roles. So it'll be three of us initially, but as we move forward, I think initially the poker coordinator should be in most of these meetings until they know that that lead reviewer is leading the peer reviewer in the right direction. With of course the lead reviewers being more experienced um, and the peer reviewers being the less experienced. So as we move forward, We'll have more experienced uh, reviewers. And then the lead reviewer will synthesize that final feedback for the course author. And then that goes back to, we'll meet with the faculty guide and the course author so everybody's on the same page. And of course we know about this iterative process of revision. The poker coordinator will then do the final check of sections A through D. And of course the instructional designer is in here to provide support. Now we really want to focus on teaching our course authors how to make the courses accessible, how to meet uh, the criteria in sections A through C, so then they can design their own courses to meet the rubric um, language, and as opposed to just doing everything for them. However, I think we know that, I mean, right now we have a course that has a lot of videos. And so as long as we know the instructor has done a great job captioning a lot of them, but really just needs that support. I mean, she doesn't need to caption all of these videos and that's where the digital um, accessibility assistant will come in. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to cover, uh, again, this is our internal website. We created, or I created these uh, rubric sections because this is this is a tra essentially a tr um, our training. It's not an official training session, but it leads all of the leads them through all of the rubric criteria. I decided not just to link to the CVC OE's eyes course design resources because uh, what I wanted was a place to build out to include more information. So if the more tips we can get, the more examples we can get, we can build this into one site and not be sending faculty out to other websites. And um, I'm gonna mention this too, because Foothill love the accessibility videos. And then I, I, when I see this, I think, okay, we need to do the same thing that Michael was talking about is build in all these little, just short, quick, you know, small bite videos in about A5, um, A6, A7, any of these criteria and build it into the website. So the idea is really to build all the resources in one place so faculty don't have to go out and eventually they can use this as a way to train. 
I think that is all that I was going to cover is um, maybe I could stop sharing and we can go ahead and go to questions. Thank you, Christine. So there have been a few, but I'm trying to see which, mostly they were um, questions about your faculty guides, mentors. Okay. Yeah, the faculty guides are essentially just, yeah, essentially mentors, experienced online uh, faculty who have been teaching online for a while, gone through the poker training, and then pairing them with the course authors to support them through the process. So they go through and do a review, but not a formal review where they write all the feedback, but just go through and say, okay, this is aligned. Um, this is incomplete, focusing on aligned and incomplete, and then working with the faculty. I think the goal was initially to really have them support that before the review. And then we kind of realized that 10 weeks was a short time, but we were trying to get certified by the end of May. So we had this timeline. I think moving forward, we're going to spend more time there because now that we've gone through some of the reviews, there's a, the faculty guides are then working with those course authors on aligning all of the criteria. Did I answer the question? If not, let me know. No, for sure. And I think that in our experience, even Helen, though she left us, <laughs> he was the, she was the uh, poker foundation, really. And what we've learned is that building that concept in their training with a brand new faculty member that, he. This is the training that we're providing, and this is the rubric that we're using. And the word review doesn't come in like till the end, right? And I think that I see more success coming from that is that it's it's baked in, it's built in, and the accessibility too. I see some people saying that they pepper it in or they, they add it in. It shouldn't be an afterthought. Well, I thank you both, Long Beach City College and College of the Redwoods. This is so helpful, and I think by the comments, others feel the same. So do you have any other questions? Anyone? Cheryl, it may have already been addressed, but Michael at Long Beach, I, I got this question. Is this local, is, is this Long Beach poker shell available to adapt to our college? And I, I think you shared that in chat, is that right? Yes, that's correct. So on the slides, just click the, the dashboard link on that particular slide and that will take you to the comments and you download it, adopt it, do what you want with it. Great, thank you so much. Peppering is good. Okay, so like, let's see, we're gonna move on. I'll bring up my little agenda. All yeah. right, so now we're gonna talk about norming. Right. Bob, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> One of the items that we put on our list was A7. And I don't know, Sean, were you going to talk about the iframe content in OER with A7 or C8? Uh, A7. Okay. Take it away, Sean. All right. Awesome. Well, hello, everybody. And we're going to take a look here. Um, this issue with um, adding and embedding OER using iframes has come up a couple of times. Okay, so looking at A7, I think this is a good opportunity uh, to see other items that really tie into effective use of the LMS tools. Uh, we use Canvas. So, you know, generally speaking, we, we say, well, you know, does a course have, uh, is it using the modules tool correctly? You know, simple things. Um, you know, the syllabus tool, whatnot. Um, that also includes uh, whatever content you're putting in a course that can also be embedded, okay? So even looking at the exemplary item, um, the, the Canvas tools are used to integrate, right? And add in innovative learning materials and activities. So, um, if we take a look at just a course, right? And, you know, usually you're dropping in uh, text and images and videos and whatnot. Um, what if you want to implement um, like an OpenStax, for example? And 
in this case, right, this OpenStax is being accessed directly online. So you can provide that for students to go to the OpenStax site and read, or um, as some of you may have seen, maybe you can add it in embedded directly into a Canvas page. So one of the questions that came up was uh, about accessibility, uh, because sometimes when you're embedding things using an iframe, uh, maybe a screen reader will have issues with it. So um, I'll just get to just the quick fix now, okay, which it really is a quick fix, is if you have embedded an OpenStax and students are able to access directly in Canvas, great, okay? But if there is an issue where students, the, they need the screen reader, it's not working for them, then you can simply provide, and this also ties into A9, uh, instructions for content, uh, you can simply provide a statement at the top that directs them. So in this case, I just put it as additional reading and providing a link, right? So you may read this uh, resource directly in the page or access it directly at the OER site. And then a little bit more instruction in the site, navigate on to the, men, uh, the menu on the left and select 1.3. So in that case, the students can just simply click on the link and then that takes them to the page. And the idea there is that if they just need, uh, you know, uh, to be able to navigate that page better than that's provided. So it's as simple as that. And I also wanted to throw in uh, when you are embedding videos, uh, that's something else that you can do, right? So uh, in this case, I just have this video embedded, but you know, you could either provide directions here in the statement above to say, you know, if you need to uh, select the more button and then uh, select share and open up in a new window or just, uh, put a link there. So um, that's really it. That's that's all I wanted to talk about here with A7. Just another um, uh, possible solution for uh, what may have been an issue. Let me also say that when you uh, edit and uh, look at the rich content editor, right? Uh, if you find the embed button you can use that to embed uh, YouTube videos or even videos from 3C uh, media, or if you do that directly. Uh, but if you're working with iframes, you do uh, need to go into the uh, HTML to bring that in. So that's it. Here's well, we have a few questions for you, Mr. Sean. All right, awesome. How does it look for students on a mobile device? That's a good question. So while you go to the next question, I'm going to bring up this course in my iPhone. <laughs> That's well, a good question. I should have had that ready to go. You like those teaching moments in time learn, just in time learning. Okay. The second one was, can you provide that embed code? I have one, but want to see what you have used. That's from Michael. Okay, so let, that I do have here. So let me bring that in. All right, so let me find the chat here. Okay, Thank you. there's that embed code. And you will see that um, I worked, actually I changed that height to uh, 500 PX instead of 100%, please. Because <laughs> uh, I did figure out that um, that was a little bit better of a look. Okay. And then when we're finished with this mobile, Sarah has a question about A9. Okay. And I, I scrolled back and found something, Sean. What about uh, mobile experience? as we are sending students in and out of the third party 
apps links relative to this. Right, right. Okay. So I'll um I'll test that real quick. And then and then well there was another question. Just about well the the whole mobile thing and then we'll get to A9 in a second. And then okay. Sylvia just added um if you have a link to OER and an embedded part, does this produce a duplicate link alert for accessibility? Which right. That. Yeah, I don't so, think it would for the iframe, but I think it might for the video thing that you suggested having the embedded video and then a link to the video. I think right. that would create a duplicate, duplicate. Mm -hmm. but I think the iframe isn't a link, so it's not going to create a duplicate link when you're linking above it directly to the OER or to the website. Could be wrong, but I'm usually not. Usually not. Yeah, and in that case, you know, when we really, you know, when we get a check like that from one of the tools that we use, um, you know, okay, well, is it really an issue? You know, um, I think, and going back to like a YouTube video, for example, um, you could just uh, provide some instructions to say, you know, if you want to watch or you need to watch this video in the YouTube site, uh, follow these steps. You know, that would be also a way to um, to overcome that. So now I'm bringing up. Um, this page. And on my iPhone, got it here. I'm going to go ahead and click on the link and see what happens. Okay. So let me say the first thing. Here's the good news is that I'm able to access directly in and scroll through. So I know the glare is a little bit bad there, but I am scrolling through the embedded frame and it looks great. Uh, the issue with the link that I provided, it's it's a dead link on the mobile app. So uh, there's an issue there. So in that case, there would have to be a, a third workaround um, in that case. Okay, so, so that, that was... That was mobile and please everyone feel free to test it out on your own mobile device because we all have different versions and so will the students and Helen you had your hand up before. I took it down, thank you. It okay. was about the duplicate link thing but Sylvia beat me to the punch very rightly so. And Lisa did mention that there is an OpenStax app. So you can look into that. Um, and I would imagine, you know, again, and that's even tying into A9, just always giving clear directions to students whenever you are working with, you know, moving them to other resources. Uh, you know, that would be great if you had something in place where, you know, we're going to be accessing OpenStax fairly regularly in this course. So here's the steps to use the app, and then you go from there. So, you know, a lot of it. Um, you know, I, I, and just a general statement when when you're working with reviewing courses, a lot of times uh, you're working with the instructor to come up with solutions. The instructor says, you know, I want to do this. I want to do that. Um, you know, you're not really there in a review situation mentoring them, but little, uh, you know, take a few minutes to just say, okay, let's kind of come up with a solution here and you can provide that in the feedback uh, in the review. It's always a great thing, so. All right, so did we cover the iframe mobile? So then Sarah had a question about A9. So Sarah, are you available? I'm available. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Let's Would hear you, it. Yeah, sure. Can I ask you just to share your screen again that you just had that page you just shared with us? Sean. Yeah. Sean, thank you. A perfect example. Um, I also really appreciate um, in these sessions connecting when things are 
a fix will hit multiple areas of the rubric. I think that's a really effective way for us to also engage faculty. So thanks for doing this. Um, I just, it came up for us recently and we just, we had a conversation about it, um, about instructions under A9. And typically we're seeing instructions, of course, and directing faculty to include instructions for their course content that is OER or video or, you know, taking people externally. And it came up around some of the readings, the content readings where, so if you wouldn't mind scrolling up, Sean, on this page, for example, um, you know, it has the title and then it's it dives into really the content under, in this case, under African music traditions, but there's no instructions there. <laughs> um, I'm just curious, like, is that sort of assumed that we students are reading in this and this is part of the course reading and or lecture, depending how the faculty member has it up, but we're really including instructions for those external videos, OER, et cetera, or I'm just kind of curious where the group is with that. So it came up recently for us. Supplementals. Yeah, so, and, and I'll, I can, uh, you know, you want to open that up to if anyone else had any comments on that. Um, in this case, I did provide instructions in the uh, orientation module that each of these items in the module, uh, it reads like a book. So great. That's the idea there. Yeah, that's what I was wondering, too, if maybe that's more exemplary than to move to that kind of piece of ensuring that it's included in the orientation modules of the responsibility the student has to engage in the content, take notes, et cetera. <laughs> right, um, I mean, and, and a big piece too is, um, of course we know with the modules and see how it all ties in. It's like A9 is like instructions. We, I think most of us tend to think like right on a page, a single web page or a Canvas page, uh, but it does tie in you know, and it's like in, in the orientation module, uh, there's an explanation of the modules themselves, right? Through course navigation and, you know, talking about how the modules work. And then you go to the modules and you'll see how uh, it, it's a pattern, you know, you go through an overview and then chapter pages, critical listening and a quiz. Right chapter page, critical listening, and then a quiz, and then so on and so forth. So, but, you know, um, now you're saying that I could sit, you know, I think to myself, well, is there something that I could put an, ex an additional statement up here on each chapter page to make it even clearer, you know, as long okay. as it doesn't clutter, you know, if it makes, if it helps, you know, then... Definitely. I didn't mean to uh, imply that you needed to do that, Sean. Sorry, I was just curious. What the, it, to me, it, it seems it it seems clear. I just wanted to it, get that kind of reassurance from the group. And Helen wrote, the intention is to provide guidance for any content element that aren't part of the basic Canvas or textbook content. So oh, yeah. I was, sorry, I was using your page because it had the OER tool with the instructions. Sorry, not to imply that you needed it there. <laughs> oh, not at all. I mean... I always want, okay, I'm going to brag on myself if I'm allowed to. I always want my course to be as amazing and perfect as it can be. So <laughs> I love feedback. I love it. So Awesome. Thank you all so much. I appreciate the, the stop and the agenda for that. Oh, no, this is the part of the agenda where we solicit questions, too. So does anybody have any others on A7, 9? I have to go back here and see what we're doing. Nope. Sylvia has her hand up. There you go, Sylvia. Well, we brought up A9 and reading assignments. So I would look for instructions. If if the if course has read chapter one and that's it, then for A9 alignment, I would look to see if there's any instructions as far as what are they supposed to do while they're reading it as well. Right, right, definitely. And that can further tie into activities that follow, right? And that's typically what, what we're looking for. You know, um, I can imagine here it's reading through this page, uh, look for A, B, and C, um, 
that ties into the listening that you'll be, um, you know, participating in immediately following, you know, uh, listen for the polyrhythms in this case or something like that. So, yeah, it's good. Helen, stop taking your hand down. What were you going to contribute? No, I, I'm trying to keep my mouth shut. No, you're, you're, a, stop it. What would you like to add? I, I was going to kind of just build on what Sean and Sylvia were saying so that it, we don't need to tell them to read the chapter. Clearly they know that part, but it is things like, hey, pay attention to the vocabulary or this section is going to be the focus of our discussion this week. So, you know, that kind of guidance where you know what you're expecting of them, but they don't know what you're expecting of them in terms of interacting with the content. And it never hurts to repeat yourself. Maria asked about what to do when reading or is the reading instruction by itself? Does that go beyond A9, she says. That was my question, Helen. Yeah, it was related to what um, Helen was saying. You know, does it go beyond to say, oh, I mean, you're going to read this. And then, I mean, I know we give, I always give specific directions on what I want them to look for, but I don't know if that's beyond the scope of A9 or, you know. That is, this, that is what A9 is looking for, in particular with supplemental things. So, right, but not necessarily. We know that, you know, sorry. Go ahead. Well, no, was, I was just going to reiterate what you were going to probably just say right now. And that is, if you say, if they have a textbook chapter to read, whatever that is, that's not supplemental. So, but you're it's not nine textbooks, nine. good textbooks generally have guiding questions or things right. that, that help focus the students. So the rubric is not asking faculty to reinvent the wheel in those cases. It's for just like you wouldn't in a face-to-face -face course turn on a video and silently expect students to know what they're right. supposed to get. So right. it's that kind of thing. So the reading may need guidance depending on what you're using, but it's really more aimed at those supplemental standalone pieces of content that you understand why you're including it, but the students may not know why you're including it. For sure. Um... And I see here, Scott brought up a point about, you know, working with um, instructors or whatnot that not, not necessarily experts with HTML. And that's where, well, if somebody did embed um, an OpenStax, but didn't exactly have it the best way, you know, that's where a lot of times in a reviewer situation, uh, you might want to find a way to okay. Well, let me let me provide you with this HTML snippet, you know, and just give you just the brief directions. Like, just keep it really simple, and that sort of. I mean, it's a learning process, right? So, you know, one thing if I've ever worked with instructors, I say don't be afraid of HTML. You know, you're going to learn a little bit of it, and from there you can you can run with it. You know. But of course, that really puts it on you and the reviewer seat to say, okay, how you know how can I um, really present it in a way that is simple, you know, it's workable, and I'm not chasing away the anyone that I'm working with. So very well said, Sean. Very well said. Um, HTML can be that type of animal. It has a organization, W3C, the World Wide Con Web Consortium that actually knows the proper method. And, but the thing is that proper method changes over time. That's why we went from HTML4 to HTML5 and we're continually migrating, fixing things. So right. yes, right. I agree with you. Thank you. It's a bear in the woods all of its own. Don't be afraid. All right, so do we have anything else maybe on section A? seven, nine or whatever, because then we're going to move on to C. And we we're going to talk about C8, it's one of our favorites. And Whitney has a timely question. She said, now it is the topic, by the way, some of us on our team think it means metacognitive self-assessment, by the way, C8 is self-assessment, about their own learning and or content self-assessment 
ideally both. Others think it must have the metacognitive self-assessment or it's not aligned. Thoughts? And while, you do, while you're thinking, I'm gonna bring up the page for us. Or Whitney, do you wanna explain a little bit more? Um, not, not much to explain, really. I just think self-assessment could be either or. Like, how are you doing learning the material? And how are you doing with your own learning? I mean, I think ideally it should have both. But to be aligned, I think it should have at least one of them. But that's my opinion. I wanted to know what everyone else thinks. Perfect. I'm going to bring up our website while you're talking. Anyone else? Don't be shy. Cheryl? Yes. So in our example, in the um, poker course, we offer both for examples. Um, you know, revising, uh, doing a draft or revising a written assignment or having a practice quiz, but then also asking on, let's say, a midterm exam, how are you doing in the course? How could you improve your study habits? What are things that you could do to improve your progress? So I think either or. But yes, ultimately, addressing both of them is the best. But I would look at as long as you have three in, you know, like one in this area, two in this area, three in this area. That's how I interpret it. Margarita. Now, I shared the resource site, site again because it, it's the one place that we can all go to to see the same language, however we might interpret it later. But um, C8 is one of those that we do discuss a lot. So maybe you can just click on that link and review the all three tabs because, again, if you're working on local poker, it's, it's going to be a norming of your local team, right? So you have to come to some agreement, maybe, is the word. Um, anything else on C8? I'm looking back. Bob, did you see anything? No, I think well covered. Uh, there's lots of conversation in chat. Um, it's a bit of an aside, but if we're done with C8, I'd like to share a, a thread I've been monitoring. Are we done? Sure. One quick second. Helen reiterated the language of the rubric doesn't require both content, self-assessment, and metacognitive. Though, of course, it's great to teach your faculty both. And so the local team may decide, well, at our college, we do want to. That's how we're going to norm it internally. But if you're going strictly by the language of the rubric, it could be either or. Um, Sylvia, quickly, do you want to discuss points versus no points? Well, I just wanted to remind everyone, if there's points, they should be relatively low points and not consider every assessment as a self-assessment. Correct. And we have somebody raising their hand. Marari? Yes, thank you. I, I was just going to say that if, if the local college decides that, then in the rubric, somehow we you have to let faculty know that you're looking for both items, right? It, it has to be clear in that. So faculty know, I need to click on these things. Thank you. Yes, for sure. Just like we would inform our students, we would inform our faculty too. Okay, if there's nothing else, then Bob, you can uh, have the floor. Yeah, Tracy had made the point that um, sharing this idea that perhaps as a way of uh, increasing participation in training, uh, you might begin to make the connection uh, pulling from CBC rubric criteria as they apply to on-site courses. And Tracy, feel free to uh, chime in and uh, share your idea and elaborate on it. But uh, that seems to be a very good idea. I mean, that was just kind of it. I, I was talking in the chat a little bit about, um, you know, we're the messages coming from upstairs are get students back to campus, focus on your on person, in person classes, like we need people here or whatever. Uh, and so then when I say, okay, now who wants to for free try and work on making their online classes better? 
um, you know, there's not, <laughs> there's not a lot of reception um, from the faculty because again, we're being told from um, top up that online uh, shouldn't be a priority anymore. And so um, I was just, if anyone does anything like specific or particular in a way, I know uh, for a lot of faculty, they realized when they took the online teaching training that um, it made their teaching better because they've never gotten any sort of pedagogy training at all. And just by looking at these type, these sorts of things, help them make those connections to all their classes, not just their online ones. And so just kind of thinking about like, are, can we somehow make those same, like get that feeling back when we're talking about poker on our campuses? Yeah, thank you. And um, I'm told at the recent DTAC meeting, DTAC had not met for quite a while, but apparently they met recently. This was part of the discussion, how to uh, look at PD more generally, more globally, and look at teaching as teaching. And then there's teaching online, there's teaching on site, but there are many uh, overlapping principles and theories and strategies that can be applied uh, that may be tweaked because of the modality. But uh, good teaching is good teaching and pr approach PD in that way. And then you might have a larger audience, uh, better attendance, et cetera. So thank you, Tracy, for bringing that up. Any other comments? I mean, it is mind boggling sometimes to think that when we first started teaching online, we were, we were an anomaly for sure. Pandemic, everybody's like, oh my gosh. However, the piece that brings it together is that if you could convince a person, a teacher, faculty in the classroom, that wouldn't it be so cool to have all of your materials in a place that you could go to and the students could go to? Because if you're using a textbook just in the classroom, let's say you're lecturing, read the textbook or do this or that, you're supposed to be the expert, right? Bring your experiences. You're not rewriting the textbook all the time. So I, I think that the parallel is that I'm just putting everything online for you to have it laid out. And then you can teach from that site. You know what I mean? Like, because it makes it so much more robust for the student, right? And I think that's what Tracy was saying is that once you have everything in place, you can better serve your students as well. Don't be making no copies. Well, but I mean, it's like, it's everything, assignment instructions. Yes. You know, if we have good assignment instructions and criteria for our online classes, we're going to have it in our face-to-face -face classes too. You know, our students need that too. So it's not just about like putting things online, but no. it's just, you know, all, all the content and stuff in your class. Mm -hmm. it, it could save a tree too. Um, <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> Helen, you're hilarious. Environmental emergencies can interrupt it face to face as well. And I was just saying, and we could save some trees by not passing out papers. But um, yeah, we hope that it, it will bridge the gap. What else? Marianne, it's absolutely great to have a Canvas shell, even teaching on campus. Yes, it serves the students quite well. Miss Wendy Bass. Hello, thank Hello. you so much for this. It's really helpful because it really wraps, gets our heads back around it too, and it keeps us refreshed. Um, what I was going to say is like, I would say 99% of our classes are web enhancing right now still. So I think that that's the one thing that's probably one of the biggest changes is that prior to COVID versus post COVID, everyone's now using the Canvas shells. And we're really struggling with our face-to-face -face instructors in some ways, reminding them that just because you're teaching face-to-face -face doesn't mean it has to be, um, it doesn't have to be ADA compliant and stuff. I would love to see like maybe this is like a, a pipe dream thing, but like a poker soft for web enhanced classes. Like what should be in a web, mm. what, what, what is recommended for a web enhanced class? Because I really do think that would be a, a wonderful way to kind of make poker. We want to operationalize poker and make it so that it's relevant to the whole campus and something that will be permanent. So keeping it relevant, like, hey, let's do this so that it can impact every class might be, a, 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 you know, just a fantasy, maybe. I don't I don't think that's a fantasy at all, because it would help everyone. Right. Like, in other words, you're guiding them 
to then put either the the most uh, um, useful materials, but you're just giving them guidance too. Well, no, I, I mean, have a rubric to go with it. I mean, like actually a poker light, like this is, let's do a poker like for our web enhanced classes in terms of what should be in a shell for a web. Oh, 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 gotcha, gotcha. So making sure it's ADA compliant, making sure, so like actually having poker aligned class, web yeah. in-person classes as well. I don't for know. Sure. We should definitely look into that. Somebody just said we should write it, Tracy. And now we have Kathy. Thanks, Cheryl. I actually just wanted to respond to Wendy. We did something similar this year in looking for a professional development activity that we could fund for everyone. And we essentially pulled five key things out of the rubric. Um, and of course, each one of those key things had some sub things, but you know, we pulled five key things that we tried to present as this should be in every Canvas shell, regardless of which modality you're using. And we offered that as a, a stipended professional development activity. And of course, one of those five items was um, accessibility. And so I think for most people, it turned into a bigger project than they anticipated for those simple five items that we um, picked. But I think we could formalize something, you know, like that into what you're describing there as a as a poker light. I don't know that we um, were doing a review, similar idea, and then they fix edits, and then we have a, a different person following up and looking at those edits. So it it, it is exactly that. Um, so we're learning a lot from trying to run that kind of professional development activity this uh, this year. Suzanne, you're funny. She said, call it five card poker. Yes, if people were familiar enough with the poker to get it. <laughs> us, for us, we just put the money right in there. And so it's our five for 500 nice. professional development activity. So that's that's what we called this one. Not to put you on the spot, but what are the five items? Well, accessibility obviously was one big one. Um, one of one of them was about contact information <clears throat> and where that should be, and so that kind of bled into having a welcome video and right. So those were some sub items underneath it. Uh, one was about your objectives, your learning objectives, and connecting those. Um, having them well connected to your assessments in each module. Mm -hmm. And then the other one was about instructions because we found one of the biggest problems is that people are not giving clear enough or specific enough instructions, especially if they're doing web enhancement to a hybrid course because they know they're going to see the students. And so their instructions are pretty minimal and vague. And mm -hmm. so that was one of the other areas. And that, of course, included having rubrics. So like I said, each one of the five items, you know, had a couple of sub items underneath it. Right. I think accessibility, as Sylvia mentions too, it's not clear to all faculty using Canvas that anything you put in there needs to be accessible. So that, you know, that's, as you said, it's probably your first item where you, where you start off. Um, there was something else. Oh, they're all asking for Michael's stuff. As you look, Cheryl, uh, and this training that makes use of the rubric and with teachers in different modalities can get even more granular than Kathy shared, uh, down to uh, the, the classroom instructor might use pair share or other uh, engaging techniques uh, during discussions with students. And there are equivalent ways to do similar things with students online. Uh, but the strategy is the same, to engage students in a certain way to have them think more deeply about the content. And uh, we can help them with, with training like this, which could be uh, guided by the rubric. For sure. Anything else in here? Thank you, Sylvia. Yes, everything has to be accessible. Um, I'm going to go back to my agenda notes and see where we're going to head. Well, do you have anybody have any other questions right now that I might have missed or we missed or comments? This is our stand up break. Math classes and music. All right, so we're going to start to talk now about C one, two and three. Some of the poker 
facilitators brought up that, you know, it depends on, it says some people are just looking for the title of the rubric item. So what are your methods, some of your methods for when you're reviewing C1, 2, and 3, which I'll bring up the, the rubric because I'm sure not everyone has memorized it. Or maybe you have. So let's, oh, I, I almost let, I almost ended the meeting. Sure. That would have been fun. Okay, here we go. Let's go to C. Well, that's B. I'm jumping. Okay, C1, 2, and 3. Authenticity, authenticity, validity, and variety. What do you all think about the summative versus um, formative assessments? And what are you looking for in these three items? Look at the outcomes of the course. Sylvia, why don't you just unmute and tell us? Okay, well, let me do an easier one. C3 variety. Um, I, I think it would be helpful if in the written narratives when we review that to include what we considered the formative assessments and the summative assessments. Then when the instructor gets that review, they can say, oh, well, you misinterpreted or no, you know, this is how it's set up. So I would just encourage people writing the reviews to add that for clarity. Cool. And then for the C1 and C2, sometimes I think of it as backwards, but for C1, um, just pointing out that you look at the definition of aligned and not just, oh, this is called, um, you know, authenticity. I'm going to see if this assessment is authentic for, you know, that type of field of study. So just mm -hmm. make sure you're looking at the definition of alignment. So for C1, look to see, um, to make sure that each out course outcome has an assessment that can measure that outcome. So if there's an outcome that says something like, I don't know, take blood pressure, random thing. If there's no assessment where they're taking blood pressure, then they are not um, um, being able to measure that outcome. Sarah? Yeah, for that particular C1, um, something that we encourage our, we call them mentees, so faculty authors, everyone uses a different term, um, we encourage them to do, which is actually a move towards exemplary, but can kind of help people ensure that their meeting alignment for C1 is to actually include the learning, the module outcomes um, in the assessment. Um, so actually state in the assessment, this discussion links to learning outcome 1.2 um, and link them back to the overview. If ideally there is like an overview and outcome page um, mm -hmm. that ties into A. So, you know, especially for um, perhaps faculty who are not using a weekly module structure, but a, you know, a chapter module or unit module that might span a couple of weeks, that has been a strategy that has been um, effective on our end to help faculty move in that area. And again, it moves them to exemplary, which we keep reminding our faculty, the goal is aligned, <laughs> but using exemplary as a way to spotlight how sometimes making those enhanced changes is better for the student, but also sometimes is the easier way for the um, faculty member to move to alignment. Exactly. Helen, two things. One, I'm going to piggyback on what you just said, which is keep in mind aligned and exemplary are totally separate. So just because a course has met the exemplary criteria doesn't mean it's also automatically meeting the aligned criteria. And if you look at A4 as an example, exemplary says there's a welcome, there's a navigational tutorial video in the course. The rest of the navigation could be a piece of junk but they have that video, so you tell them they're aligned, excuse me, you tell them they're exemplary, but they're not actually aligned. So you really need to make sure your reviewers understand there are very distinct ratings and it really can make a difference on some of them. About C1, what I would say is that 
the rubric was written before the idea of authentic assessment really came to the fore. And so we had a less sophisticated use of the word authentic in this original rubric language. And so a lot of you are probably looking at the aligned definition and thinking, well, that's not what authentic means. Why am I, you know, really what authentic means is the exemplary level. And it's because we we had such a less sophisticated understanding of the idea of authentic. And so that kind of low bar of, are we at least ask, making sure the activities are demonstrating the outcomes? That's what we were using as authentic. So I just was clarifying the history of it and why some people may think the language is a little off from the way we now interpret authentic. Thank you, Helen. It is mind boggling when I first started doing all of this many moons ago, the disconnect between what instructors were having their students do and the outcomes that were actually listed for the course or for the module. So it's nice to see them joining. There was, um, I did put the link to that section on the resource site and there was one up here. Oh, yes, about the, there's a math thing going on. The captions aren't ready yet for the video on that page, but they should be by tomorrow. We sent them in for Monday. So just if anyone asks, why are their captions not correct? They're on their way. So the link that Bob put in there is where the archive will be for that um, webinar. And then Suzanne asks, what if the outcome is higher level bloom, like explain? And the assessments are all multiple choice tests with that count. How y'all feel about that? Helen says, no. Definitely no. No, no, nope. So there you go, Suzanne, nope. I was stacking the deck, but- Thank I, you but so I, I, much. <laughs> love it kind of wondering though for for because he, what Helen what you said about um authentic made me wonder like it, how much can we read into the authentic right like if it is explained are we looking for something like write an essay or or something along those lines are you asking me in particular or or the group I'm asking the group this was just was kind of in related to to what you said about um authentic but yeah to the whole group because you know I have a two-bit opinion, but I'll hold off on it. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Well, then I'll give mine. So when you said that, Suzanne, explain, is that to write an essay? And then I think authentic is in real world. When did you write an essay last? Mm. Uh, a paper, or, you know, a briefing. Yes, you will write white papers in your life. You'll write narratives and things, but Again, how authentic is that essay depending on the course? And it could be totally, uh, you know, um, it would be for an, um, an English professor, right? If you're learning to be an English professor, then you'd have to learn how to write an essay. But, you know, you can get into the weeds with anything. Anybody else? Sylvia, the outcome has explain or create, and there's only MC quizzes. Okay. And I don't think assessment could be used. Okay. Maybe we can... What Suzanne is saying makes me think that explain so we can use the term authentic to mean not real world authentic, but is it authentic to what the learning outcome is? So maybe I don't ask them to write an essay, but I ask them to write me three sentences explain. I mean, I, if my learning yeah. outcome is explain, I am asking them to explain. That's where the authentic idea comes into it. And so if I'm not asking, if I don't need them to explain, then I rewrite my objective to demonstrate whatever it is that I do want them to be doing to show mastery. And then I think to tie it in, you would look at the instructions for the assignment, right? And if it just said explain blah, blah with no oomph, like, what kind of detail do you want? Like to actually pull it out of how do you want them to explain? It's a circle or even an audio or a PowerPoint presentation or a video. 
this chat goes by fast. Janet, to clarify to mark example, they must also meet. Yes, Janet, I just scrolled back up. So if you, you have to meet aligned to get to exemplary. Is that correct statement? Yes. Consensus there. Down, down, down. Yes. Poker is so good at uncovering not so good outcomes at SLOs. And, and that's very true, Whitney. The CORs, as you get more into the, the whole rubric or alignment, you certainly do go back and say, hmm, those outcomes just might need to be revised. Thank you. Anything else on that? I was wondering this, thanks. Oh, Sylvia. All right. Yeah, I, I was just curious if people's experience after, you know, while they're going through this course review process, it's like, oh, I think we should be writing our outcomes. You know, this isn't really working. So I was just curious uh, how many people, how many colleges, you know, went through that process to revise their outcomes. You can raise your hand, you know, you can do a check mark, let her know if anybody has, has anyone. I did for one class said, well, and how many of you at the college with the COR have intentional broad student learning outcomes for the course, right? Because I know at Coastline, where I have most of my experience, they would go from like five course outcomes because they weren't really hitting the broadness of, of it down to maybe one or two. And then when you're trying to match the assessments, it gets a little bit, some say easier, some say trickier because you have to actually map it out with your assignments. How about anybody else here? Faculty review their CORs start talking. Oh, that's interesting, Meg. Instructors are responsive to making better unit objectives when their CSLOs are not so great, but no movement. All right, Jennifer. Good morning. So I think Hi. I I know the answer to this already, but I just want to check. So for C2 validity, does every single unit level objective need to be assessed in that unit? So for example, um, could we have an objective that maybe gets assessed a couple of units later, like on a midterm? Does that make sense? Like the student needs to learn that information, but there may not be a question about it on that particular unit quiz. Or maybe there isn't a quiz for that unit. Maybe there's only a discussion. I just addressed this issue. And I think um, in the case of summative assessments, you may be addressing that in earlier weeks, but then measuring it in a later week. So I think it's unavoidable to have um, objectives that are placed in different weeks, even if they're not measured in that exact week. And Helen's post, did you see the chat? That C2 isn't meant to be viewed per unit, but for the whole, the course as a whole. That's really helpful, thank you. For sure. Frank, how are you doing, Frank? Is it possible for a course to be lined with A4 if the course does not have, <clears throat> excuse me, a homepage and uses modules view as their course homepage? I love talking about this all the time. I just had one yesterday at the college. So what's, what's the mitigating factor there if you have modules as your first look at a course. Is I know, a, I know. Let me hear you, Hal. And my family calls me Hal. Um, it has to have a clear starting point. 
And there are colleges, I don't know if they still do, but there have been colleges that require faculty to use the module view as their homepage. And so we didn't, the rubric did not want to prevent them from getting aligned. You just need to make sure the instructor has a clear starting point. So um, as in like a, the first module to begin with or the beginning yes. of each module, there's a clear starting it, point. It, well, I that the intention of that is when a new a canvas, a student new to canvas first gets in the course, do they know what to do? So presumably the flow of the course will help the overall navigation. This really was more when we normed it, it was about what do we do with a student that doesn't know to click the modules link or doesn't know how to get help? How do we, they know where to go? And so really it's, it's meant for the beginning of the course. And there, it could be a local decision, but we've come across courses where they have it clearly labeled start here, but they have other modules before the start here module, and that can be really confusing. So locally, you guys may want to kind of figure out what are our parameters and, you know, just start here if we tell them that, and that's where it links to from the link on the homepage, they miss all that. So anyhow, there's things for you guys to decide. So sure. it's not as simple as if, if when a student clicks on the course from their dashboard and they're taken right to module view, that doesn't automatically mean they're incomplete for A4. If they don't have a clearly labeled start here, either gotcha. module or page, which then explains to the student, here's what I expect you to do this first week or the first, you know, whatever it is, that would, we, as a normed community, we would consider that incomplete. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Two things that are coming up too is that the mobile doesn't show the home page. And then Nora asked, could you require a true home page as A4 locally? You can require whatever is deemed good at your college as a whole. It falls over for me, not only the home page being a clear starting point with the start here button, perhaps, or it's just more friendly. I mean, anybody just going into to, um, Canvas and they see the gray bars, it might be okay. I know where to start because we just talked about this this week, right, Christine? There's a start here on the module title, but if it's a header, blah, blah, blah. So you guys just have to decide, if I don't know anything about this, do I know where to start the first time I get in there? And then we go into the navigation later. However, mobile is used a lot, right? Shake your heads, yes. But it isn't the end all or be all either. So if the very first time they're looking at a course is on a mobile phone, then how could you give them a heads up that it's gonna look different, you know, with a homepage? Miss Susanna. There, uh, just to to add on to the mobile piece. So when when students first log in, at least in my student view, the very first thing at the top says home for the home page. And so if you don't have that, I don't know that a student would know to click on modules. So even more of an issue for for students using the app, which Cheryl, I'm hearing you, is not the be all and end all, but one other reason to use homepage. So you're split too. Plus your friendly face. Oh, unless Canvas would let us put bigger pictures in the module. Well, headers. I think if you had home and your first item in the module said start here or begin here or something, you're covering both places. Absolutely. In Canvas student app, the first thing I see is home modules and announcements. Oh, and you gave us a picture here, Tracy. Thank you. Yeah, but see, you can see it says home and then it says front page because I have a home page, my front page set as my home page. If you had modules set as your home page, that home button would still take them to the modules. It would still be there. Yes, true. And that's where Sylvia's point of, so then make sure your first module is labeled start here will obviate the issue of students not knowing where to start. 
Good point. Did we miss any questions in the chat that we haven't covered for you? There's a lot going on. All righty then, let's go back to the reminders, unless you have any more questions. All righty, let's see here. Well, we did remind you about our resource course. Thank you. Um, or Bob, you want to take this one? Uh, why don't you take the, the first one and I'll do the rest. Okay, we have a poker course addendum, which is the accessibility piece for those of your faculty or staff that took the poker course before this January to add accessibility in. January forward, the poker course they take now is six weeks long. And it is also, it has um, accessibility incorporated into it as a reviewer. So if you have anyone that's pre-January poker trained, you might wanna recommend the accessibility addendum. It's self-paced, but we also check the last assignment to make sure that people are understanding the accessibility um, key factors, and then they can get the badge. I'm just looking here. Um, and then the poker registration, do you have that link handy? Because I can grab it. Well, actually it's on your dashboard. Raise a hands. Everybody know where their dashboard is? Good, you go to local poker resource site. Last tab is the dashboards. Thank you, I love the interaction of the hand raising. Um, and as you'll see, sadly, there's only two columns now, but find your dashboard and at the top right, there's a participation agreement link. Anyone that would like to take the poker course, they will click there, sign away their whatever, and then they'll get the link to the poker course. Having said that, um... The demand for the poker training course has been very high this term, and we have offered, uh, we started with four, now we have offered a fifth section, that filled up right away. The only course that has seats available right now, the last count was five seats available, is the poker four course that uh, I think is begins in mid to late May and completes before June 30th. And uh, uh, and to anticipate your question, I've already asked Stacy to contact all our poker uh, course facilitators to see if they can offer an additional section. And they're all too busy now. They're they're all they're all very busy and will be through the rest of spring. So uh, we do have five seats available in Poker Four. Thank you, Christine. She beat me to the link. Open sections are always listed in the participation EU and potential reviews can look there too. So so many courses to the exchange. Cheryl, why don't you take that one? Well, alrighty then. So those of you who are certified, when you go to your dashboard, at the bottom of the page, you will have seen a new form where you just add the instructor's name, the course title, and the course number. And when you hit submit, the course will be then submitted to be badged. It's very quick and easy. Excuse me, those of you who are in the capstone process, once you get the three courses aligned, then you will do the same process, basically. Um, there was a question earlier about, a, oh, Sarah, from Sarah and um, that district. If you have a course, that is certified at your college. And then the instructor teaches that very, very same course at another college within your district or not, then you just submit the information. And I'm gonna, I'll have to get that link for you, but you don't have to go through any review or anything. However, just make sure it's the very exact same course because sometimes they go, um, I, I can't even think of an example right now, but I mean, English 100 is probably English 100, but just make sure that this, if it, there's a CID, you can't go wrong because it's the same one. But if the if there's no CID and the course 
numbers may be different from the two colleges. Just make sure the outcomes are the same. And there's Sarah. And um, then you can submit the, the new college would submit the court. Sarah? That was my question. <laughs> and, the, and the new, so we're a part, just for everyone else's sake, we're part of a three college district. Um, so all, everything you just described is in place. It's the same course, same CID, et cetera, in our particular example. So she was, um, this particular instructor and course was added to our college's um, dashboard in early February. Okay. Um, so now then, then it's our sister college then would basically submit it the same way I did, right? Just fill out the form and- Right. Right. There. Okay, great. That, thank you okay. for clarifying that. Stacy, did you want them to send it to support first or I'll just give her the link? No, exactly how Sarah explained it. Okay. Exactly. After a course is poker certified, could instructors add content, for example? That's a great question, Norma. The, the hope, out there. You hope they do. Well, the hope is that your review process and in working with the instructor to get the course aligned, you've taught them how to fish in terms of maintaining alignment with the rubric. So the intention has always been, we know faculty are going to make changes to the course after it's aligned. It's just a reality of what we do as instructors. And so, yes, they can add content. You just, in your training process, are going to want to make sure they understand and it needs to maintain alignment with the rubric. Don't just throw in inaccessible content or don't, you know, whatever it is they would do. So, yeah. yeah. That's that's critically important. Our process as it stands now assumes that there is some professional development going along with course alignment. So the teacher author is learning the how to and how to maintain uh, alignment um, because we aren't prescribing any return to that course a year or two from now. Your local poker team may decide to do that, but that's not part of uh, something we are requiring. So, so this is why that instructor preparation and development is so important during the alignment process so they can maintain alignment. That's why we stress the preparation of the faculty and the mentoring and the guidance that they get when they're going through the process will go a long way. Super groovy, love it. Okay, uh, anything else? On the last bullet, just uh, if there are some in this room that are part of a college that has not yet uh, and maybe had pushed the pause button on local poker and you'd like to re-kick kick start that, uh, contact Sean or Cheryl uh, looking on your dashboard to see uh, if you can get that restarted and uh, we can help you. And Janet, I'm glad you asked the question so everyone will hear the answer at the same time. When your course is badged, it will show up on cvc.edu if and only if it's being offered in a semester and there are seats available. So if a person is badged and they're not teaching the course right now, they're not going to see it, right? Does that answer your question? Yeah, well, it does and it doesn't. So I'm getting a lot of questions about like, how do they know that it's actually been like past the badging? Like I submitted to you guys, right, for the go through the badging process, you know, not to you, but just through the, you know, badging, you know, you know, anyway, so, and they're not teaching, you know, it's not online for a summer, for example, but it, it's been submitted. So is there a place they can go to see that that course has, or that I can okay. see yes. the success? Your dashboard. Your dashboard will list every course that's aligned. Right. And, and you just let them box. know that that's, yeah, if it's aligned. Now, if it's aligned today, the badge might not be oh, in no. process for a minute or two. But yeah, for sure. Right. So, so if they're not teaching for a while, yeah, explain it to them that they won't see it on the website, but it's there. Awesome. Yay. So if a student, I mean, if a course is full, students can't add themselves to the wait list. That's a Bob question. Uh, Bob or Stacy, if you mean the poker training course, we do have a wait no, list. No, I think she means students, cvc.edu. 
the exchange? The exchange. Ah, no, there's no wait list through the exchange. Right. Uh, if there are open seats, a student can immediately enroll, assuming we have a home college and teaching college relationship. But uh, uh, it does not send them to your home call, your teaching college waitlisting process. They would have to do that directly through the college at hand. Uh, uh, from Jose, this is a direct message. And Jose, there may be other non-credit people here. I hope you don't mind me asking your question. He asks, when will non-credit courses be available through the exchange? They already are. Some colleges are sending their non-credit fully online courses uh, in their data to, to our exchange, and some are not. Um, we are having our roadmap uh, solutions should be available by the end of this calendar year to make that more clear to students so they don't accidentally enroll in a non-credit course thinking that it satisfies their, their credit program. Uh, but right now, some colleges are already doing that. They're sending us their non-credit online courses in their uh, read-only data. And I don't know if Janet Williams is still here, but NOCE, North Orange Continuing Ed, she is developing the local poker process and they are reviewing fully online non-credit courses to align them to the rubric. And it's just fabulous. Jennifer has a question. I had a question. I mean, I know you said that the if the course is full, it's not gonna show on the CVC exchange. Um, but the concern with that is that then the students don't even know the course is available. Is there any way that it could show is full so that at least they know it's there? Because um, I, I think that sometimes students, if they don't know that course is available, maybe next semester or, you know, when it might be available, there there's they just might miss out. So that was my question. Okay. And, and Jennifer, um, this is a good question for our CBC consortium meeting if you attend those. So um, first of all, students can see all the courses even if they're full, but they need to manage the filters you see on the left side of the page after they go in and look at a search. The date is very important when the start date was. And if they unclick the default boxes, um, which prioritize open courses and teaching college courses, then they can see all the courses there. But remember, the primary purpose, meaning uh, of the exchange, is to allow students in a current term that want to take a course, they have space in their calendar, but their home college, uh, all those courses are impacted. The idea of the exchange is they can immediately find an equivalent course that will satisfy uh, the requirements in the exchange and Therefore, the default, we think, should be those courses that have open seats mm -hmm. so be for that purpose, for that use case student, which is our, our primary student. And most would go to their campus first, maybe, to look at the schedule, which would show all of the courses that are available. But I guess it's it could be 50-50. I don't know how many students are going straight to CVC Exchange bypassing their college. One last question, because we have two minutes left. Meg says, if a class is 100% online, but has synchronous meetings, can it get the quality aligned badge? Uh, yes, uh, but <laughs> any courses that have live elements to them, they need to pass the current version of our rubric. So that, that would mean they have to have enough asynchronous things for us to look at uh, in order to judge, yeah, you meet A, B, C, and D uh, with, with those asynchronous parts of the course. Now, of course, that uh, then, then therefore, we're looking at kind of a, an asynchronous-synchronous hybrid course. It would be very difficult, perhaps impossible in the current state, to align a course that's fully online, I'm sorry, fully synchronous, unless we can see that course to judge it, it, whether or not it aligns, you see? So uh, the answer is yes, but with that qualification. And it's not, all, each time you teach synchronously online, it's not gonna be the same each time, exactly. So there's things that can come and go. Well, 
We thank you very, very much. We thank our presenters, Long Beach City College, College of the Redwoods, because we learn so much when you share your experiences. Um, let us know if you have any other questions. Our emails are on the dashboards. And now everybody's gonna just want me now. So we're good. Have a great weekend.